not, she'll tell us when. Meeting is now streaming live. Likely, let's see. Oh. Okay, I think that we are live. So let's assume that we are. Awesome. Okay, so hi, I'm Genevieve Anderson. I'm the writer director of uh, Dust One, uh, which actually will be showing at the Esquire Theater this weekend in Cincinnati, and we will be there to do the Q and A's. Um, that screening is largely happening because of my guest today, uh, Scott Gilliam, who I'm about to introduce. But first, let me say that this uh, weekly Facebook Live series that we're doing called Talk About Immigration uh, is our effort to bring different voices from the immigration advocacy community together to help educate us about what is happening in real time um, at the border and also about some of the issues that are at play in the upcoming election, what's at stake and who is most at risk. So today I'm really excited to be uh, welcoming Scott Gilliam, who is a former um, insurance uh, insurance attorney and corporate lobbyist. Those are difficult words to wrap my mouth around because I don't often say those words, um, who had uh, a 30 year career and left that career to start Encore Legal LLC, which is a human practice or human interest law firm um, focusing on pro bono work for immigrants and uh, asylum seekers. So uh, Scott and I met just a little bit, bit of a backstory. Scott and I met through our screening in uh, May on the Latin Heat Entertainment uh, platform when we screened Dust One and did a Q&A there. He found us through, I think, a Facebook group some one of those Facebook groups you found, you found us and we met, the, but this- uh, One of the immigration advocacy groups that I'm part of I actually had a post about the, about the movie and that's how I heard about it. Awesome. Uh, the American Immigration Council had it posted. Had a post about it, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful because you and I now have been talking um, uh, over the last several months, but this is actually our first time um, meeting. So this is the new meeting in person. So it's really nice to meet you. Yes. <laughs> so um, even though we've talked about a lot of things, I still am really, really interested in your background, sort of how you became um, an insurance attorney, what that means, and, and mostly like what, what does a cor corporate lobbyist do? What was your past life? Okay, so in the 30 years, uh, the first 10 years, I was uh, uh, an insurance lawyer. The, the title is called insurance defense lawyer. Um, and that's when uh, I, you know, I defended auto accident cases, slip and falls, product liability. Um, and it's called insurance defense because when you're sued, quite often an insurance policy affords you a defense and a lawyer. Okay. So if you're if you run a stop sign, hit somebody and they sue you, you, you turn in an insurance claim and your insurance company assigns a lawyer to defend the case, okay? So I, I, was, I, I, was, a, I was a civil a civil litigation. I was a civil litigation trial lawyer on the defense side for 10 years. And I you know, defended people in auto accidents, you know, stores when people fell, uh, manufacturers when products fail, things like that. Um, and a big part of that is looking closely at people's um, injuries and taking their doctor's depositions and trying to get to the bottom of just how injured they are and was it my client's fault. So that was 1986 to 1996 in Toledo, Ohio. And towards the end of that 10 years, I was actually a staff attorney for Cincinnati Insurance Company doing that work for people insured by Cincinnati. And from that perch, I was... Um, recruited to become the head lobbyist for the company. I, you know, my boss knew of my interest in politics and I was, um, a political science degree, I was a political junkie, you know, from when I was age 12, you know, age 12, it's 1972. And I was worried to death that Richard Nixon was gonna lose. You may recall it was a landslide. He only lost Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. And I had a, card table set up in my living room with a map and I was filling in the states as he won. So I was a little junkie nerd from age 12, 
Wow. So, um, so you don't really, you know, to try and find a lobbying job, you just don't graduate from college and you apply for one, it kind of happens. So from that perch with Cincinnati, I was approached and I thought, well, I've done this insurance defense stuff for 10 years. I'm pretty good at it. I'm kind of tired of it. So let's try this. So that was 1996. And that's what, when I, when I was, you know, I, when I was hired to do that job, I moved to Cincinnati and we've been here ever since. So from 96, 1996 until I retired in April of last year, I was the head lobbyist for Cincinnati Insurance Company. It's also known as Cincinnati Financial Corporation. It's on the NASDAQ stock exchange and it's a Fortune 500 insurance company. So my job as an insurance lobbyist, um, I always tell people, think of me as the ambassador of the company. My job is to make sure that we have good relations with everyone who regulates us, including mm. those who actually regulate us, which is basically state insurance departments, and those who want to regulate us, which can be state legislatures or Congress. And there's always been a tension between the federal government and the insurance industry. We prefer the states to regulate us because the states understand our business better because there's so many differences from state to state. Every state has a different body of tort laws that govern lawsuits. Each state have different things that impact their climates and their weather systems. So we've always wanted to, we've always preferred a 50 state approach to insurance regulation. So as a lobbyist, my job was basically to say to the federal government, thank you very much, but we don't need you in our business. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep in mind that this, the kind of insurance I was involved with, property casualty, is very different from health insurance, okay? So when, whenever I would say I was an insurance lobbyist, people would always say, oh, you mean you're a health insurance lobbyist? That's sickening and disgusting. It's like, no, it's not health insurance. So health okay. insurance is a quagmire of regulation, state, federal, local. But, my, but the insurance I was in was primarily regulated by the states. So mm -hmm. my, um, I cut my teeth in Washington just making sure that the message of you don't need to regulate us, the states are doing fine, uh, was, was everyone knew it. Interesting. Um, and so let, me, let me also add that lobbying is, um, people think all lobbyists do is play golf and have cocktails. Um, but there's a lot of prep time that goes into uh, making your case. You know, hundreds of hours are spent reading and writing and preparing documents. And when there's an issue you want to lobby on, you have to have it down so that um, sometimes you might have one minute when you see a congressman down the hallway or his chief of staff and you run up to him and say, hey, on blah, 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 I, I want you to know, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and um, so it's very, um, and there's a lot of relationship building. Half of our time is spent making sure they know who I am so that when they have a question about insurance, they'll call me. And then um, lobbying is successful when you can do it in short sound bites and use a lot of metaphors and analogies. So mm -hmm. um, insurance is very complicated. So I would often start a meeting with a congressman or a staffer by saying, Think of, uh, think of, as, of insurance as the gasoline that keeps the engine of the economy running. If businesses didn't have any insurance, they couldn't operate because they would have no way to protect them from, you know, uh, property damage, lawsuits, et cetera. So um, I'm gonna unplug myself now because as a lawyer and a lobbyist, I can just talk forever. You can talk forever. What I am curious though, if the 12 year old boy Right. Once you made it to D.C. and you're in this politi political sphere with all these heavy hitters, did you feel like you had arrived? I did. It was like um, and, and I, I did. Um, and of course, a lawyer and a lobbyist, there's a healthy dose of ego. You can't do it if you don't have an ego. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's a fine line between, you know, proper use of the ego and, and, and your head getting out of proportion. But, you know, when I would walk around Capitol Hill and all these people say, hey, Scott, how you doing? When I'm invited to the White House uh, for a meeting, I'm just thinking, 
this is it. What can be better than this? I mean, when um, Speaker Boehner was from my congressional district and he was a big fan of our company and, and we became personal friends and we still are. And when I was at the height of my insurance lobbying, when um, there were some contentious issues at that time in Congress involving insurance, and when people would ask Boehner what he thought about you know, X, Y, Z, and he would say, well, I need to check with Scott Gillum and Cincinnati Insurance and I'll get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was, that was from building up a relationship, but not, um, but a credible relationship where when I spoke, it was fact, not fiction. And the most important thing for a lobbyist is your credibility. If you lose your credibility one time, you're done, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, um, I think that was the question you answered. Asked. Yeah, well, I, I wanna make the transition now to sort of, to what happened. What was the beginning of you having this radical shift in consciousness, this rewiring of your brain, as you say? Okay, so it was May of 2013, and I was in Chicago for a reinsurance conference. Reinsurance is insurance that insurers buy so that if they get hit by a bunch of bad stuff at one time, they have some insurance to go to to help pay claims. So it's important for me to understand reinsurance. So I was at a reinsurance conference and it was day two and they were gonna break into groups, small groups to actually write reinsurance contracts. And I thought, uh, I don't need this. I, I, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for a walk. It's a beautiful spring day, the magnificent mile. So I go for a walk and I end up um, over um, on Wabash Avenue near Holy Name Cathedral, which is the cathedral for the Archdiocese of Chicago. So um, I, you know, I went, it was around noontime. So I went in for the, for the daily mass. I'm not someone who goes to mass every day, but I love checking out beautiful big cathedrals and churches. So I go in there and go to the noontime mass you know, 12 people, the Cardinal of Chicago is in the front pew, just like one of the regulars. And when I come out, um, there's, a, there's a woman named Wanda, who's literally sitting on the church sign and she mumbles something about money for food. So I gave her some money and I crossed the street and I thought to myself, I've always heard how cool it is when you actually share a meal with them or give them a meal. So I ran into a corner deli and got a sandwich, fries and drink and ran back hoping she would still be there. And she was still sitting there. So I walked up to her and I said, um, would you allow me to give you the gift of lunch? And she just looked up at me and started sobbing. And we, we, we hugged on the sidewalk. And I have a safety pin here to jab myself if I start to tear up, I can't find it right now. But, um, something happened. I mean, I looked into her eyes and she looked into my eyes and it was human being to human being. And I crossed the street and I thought, hmm, I think that's, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. There's all these, all these people that no one cares about them. I need to care about them. So that's, that's how this all kind of started. Um, and the next few months, you know, in my business travels, this started to be my game. I would, I would be on the lookout for people on the margins. And I would just, you know, I'd walk up and say, hi, my name is Scott. What's your name? And amazing things happen. People love to hear their name. People love to be talked to and treated with respect. Um, and so, you know, over the years, um, you know, over the next, let's see, that was May of 2013. So um, by that Thanksgiving, um, one thing led to another. And I started a group in Cincinnati called the Mustard Seed Servants. Um, you know, you, everyone's read about the mustard seed in the Bible. And the idea was to get people from the suburbs to go into inner city Cincinnati and just uh, do ha hold events for uh, the homeless, the people living on the streets. And the first event we did was on Thanksgiving. Um, you know, there's always all these big meals, you know, in the morning, you know, for the people on the streets uh, for Thanksgiving. But then the meal's over and the day ends. So at this church in Over the Rhine, which is inner city Cincinnati, one of the 
one of the people I got into contact with there said, why don't we have a party for them in the afternoon? Because the rest of us get to have Thanksgiving all day, but they, as soon as they get their free meal, it's over. So we had this event called Count Your Blessings, and we, um, we made it like a Super Bowl party. They never get to have fun foods and stuff like that. So we had, you know, all kinds of party food. Um, we had um, a TV set with football on so the guys could watch football. We had, and there's, there's, there's kids who live on the streets with their parents. We had a Christmas tree that they could decorate. Um, and it was just kind of like, wow, you know. <laughs> How many people were involved? Um, there was about 75 volunteers. Wow. And, and I was going to say my wife, she's filling someone's coffee cup, one of the guests. And he's got a tattered Bible. And he looks up at her and he thumps in his Bible and he says to my wife, you are in this book. So. Wow. So how... I mean, that's a big deal. I, I feel like that, um, that, that level of giving and opening yourself up. Um, we talked a little bit about this, about what it, hmm, about the present moment and the, the, the closed, how, how closed we are on both sides. And it does feel like there's these two camps and that kind of closure is, is a buffering against the feeling of love, right? The, right. the, the call to love. And, right. and when you opened yourself up to, to need, to the people who were in need and you offered not just food, but, but intimacy, right? An intimate environment where people could come and share and, and sort of experience togetherness, that uh, it's, it's risky, right? Because yeah. you, really start, you really start to care. And um, so what happened to you? What happened in that giving? In, um, you know, a thought just occurred to me that, you know, people would say to me, well, how can you do that? How can you just walk up to somebody on the street who, you know, have no idea who they are and just start talking to them? And, and, and I, hundreds have said this to me. Um, and all I can say is, I don't know. I, it just happens. And I feel like I'm supposed to do it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, my entire life, I always, um, I was always involved in trying to help people out. And I think I got this from my dad. He was an insurance adjuster. And I can recall one time him telling me, there was some times when I had a claimant who, you know, didn't really deserve to be, you know, didn't really have a legitimate claim, but I would always pay him something just to help him out. <laughs> now he's, Rest in, rest in peace, he's gone now, so his former employers can't get mad at him. But I just think I have it in my DNA to help people, okay? And I, I think that, um, this is kind of a heady thing to say, but I really think that my years as a lawyer and my years as a lobbyist, I was in training to be able to do something, you know, if I would, would, would retire early to help people with nobody in their corner with using my skills and talents. There was a, there was a priest who was a good friend of mine. And when I, right when, shortly after I started the mustard seed, mustard seed servants, he said to me, what's so incredible is, you know how the world works. You were a lawyer, you were inside government, you know how all this stuff works. And so no one's in a better, pl in a better place to give back and try and help those with nobody in, in their corner than somebody with the experience like you have. Interesting. And then, you know, so at some point, a transition to immigration and between the mustard seed servants and the immigration piece, um, there was a four year friendship with a homeless man in Washington. Um, I'm just going to call him Terry. That's not his real name, but I met him on a sidewalk encounter. And over the next four years, the experiences we had, he showed me, he, he took me inside what it's like to live as a homeless person. And, you know, we go home every night to our castles. And when it gets cold outside, we can turn on our heated seats. 
Well, when it turns cold on the, on the cement sidewalks in Washington, there's no heated seats to, to lie on. So, um, and it just, it just, it just, I like to tell people I was rewired. When, when this happened, I couldn't go back to who I used to be. And towards the end of my lobbying career, um, I just became less, I, I became almost like a shell doing what I was supposed to do when my heart was with people that had nobody in their corner. I mean, the last weeks of 2017, the last eight weeks, I'm in Washington Monday through Friday lobbying for tax reform, which I started to have some moral issues with. Um, and, you know, I've worked hard and I've put together quite a safe nest egg for, for retirement. So then the idea started, you know, maybe you should retire early, okay? Um, so there reached a point where I just couldn't do it anymore because um, I, I felt empty and hollow. Um, I, felt, I felt empty and hollow lobbying for tax cuts for big business when all these people who were hurting are being ignored. Um, and then when, you know, early in the Trump administration, when they were trying like heck to get the Affordable Care Act removed, and although that didn't directly impact my company, you know, we were part of the glut who wanted the Affordable Care Act removed. And I can recall one time when I was um, asked to do something on that. Um, and I, in hindsight, it's like, I wish I could have said, no, I refuse to do that on moral grounds. So it just got harder and harder to be, you know, part of the card carrying lobbying crowd. And that's what prompted me to um, pull the trigger and retire last April um, to what I like to call an encore career to use my skills and talents to help people with nobody in their corner. How did it affect your personal life making that decision? Personal um, professional life. A lot of people thought I was crazy. Um, he's on the top of his game. Why is he retiring? Um, many friends didn't understand it. And um, it became, you know, I started to, you know, I registered as a Democrat. I called myself a progressive liberal, but as time went on, I thought to myself, none of these labels really fit. What happened to me was I had a pro-people conversion. People. A pro-people conversion. Yeah. Can we put that in quotes? A pro-people conversion. I had a pro-people conversion. I'm a member of the pro-people party. I'm right? writing that down. <laughs> um, and it's like, people mattered to me more than things or achievements or trophies. Um, right. So, um, and you know, I just, I have to kind of, I, I need to find that pin and poke myself because <laughs> there were many ramifications in my personal life with friends and family who just thought, what happened to Scott? Um, not not so much my family, um, but just friends who um, just did who didn't understand what drove me. You know, when I would when I would be at a social function, and people were making fun of immigrants, um, I just couldn't I couldn't take it. And sometimes it got kind of ugly, um, but uh, <laughs> I better well, stop. The gap, though, the gap, again, between, you know, being the, the comfiness, right, and, and the other reality, the, those of the, the least among us, right, there's this gap. And you went into the gap. And, and in a way, you held up a mirror, right? I mean, I would think that the resistance would be about don't, I don't, because why wouldn't people support you doing good work for other people? You know, why wouldn't they support it? Unless, of course, you doing that held up a mirror that pointed out, that points out in a way, not just our privilege, but our, our unwillingness as to address the gap, our unwillingness to address that, yeah, there's systemic racism here, or yeah, we're not treating, we're not even dealing with the homeless in, right. in any kind of productive and proactive way. And we certainly are having a hard time dealing with why 
we are so anti-immigrant at the moment. Like what are the root causes of all of that? So that must have, I imagine, it must have felt strange, you know, to 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 be in the gap, right? And to be knowing that you're going somewhere else, but you know, you're still very connected, obviously, right. to your but then I always felt alive when I was with the people in the gap or when I was um you know, advocating for people in the gap. I mean, when I, um, in 2017, we all recall the weekend when the president um, instituted or made his first try to institute the Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. And it happened on a Saturday. I and mean, we can recall, you know, around the country, there were protests at airports. So the, the Monday after that started, um, I'm in Washington, um, you know, for a week of insurance lobbying. And I come back from the Hill and I turn on the TV and I see a live shot um, of uh, a protest at the US Supreme Court against the Muslim ban. So I thought, I'm going down there. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I'm going down there. So I went down, <laughs> of course, if people would, people, if people knew that I did that, and of course now many are gonna know because I'm saying it right now. In fact, there's people I've told this to and they just kind of flip out. How, how could you go to a protest at the Supreme Court? I mean, what if, what if you were captured on camera? It's like, I really didn't care. So yeah. I went down to the Supreme Court, you know, it's like uh, eight o'clock at night and it's, cold, it's a cold night in February and um, I'm protesting against the Muslim ban and I'm freezing cold in these two, um, these two gals in front of me, they said, here, here's a hand warmer so you can try and stay warm, okay? So a few weeks later, I'm back in Washington again, and I, it's the end of the day, and I always like to walk from the house side of the Capitol across the Capitol to my hotel, because I just love the grandeur of the U.S. Capitol and what it stands for. And as I'm, as I'm getting close to my hotel and I'm on the Senate side, I can hear in the distance, um, that sounds like a, a protest going on. So on the on the grounds of one of the Senate office buildings, there was a protest going on. So I waltzed over in my trench coat and briefcase and saw that it was a pro protest against um, Scott Pruitt, who was Trump's pick to be the EPA chief. So I'm, you know, in the crowd and, you know, cheer, cheering and chanting along. And this woman looks at me and says, um, are you did I see you at the Supreme Court protest a few weeks ago? No. Yeah. Well, it turns out it was the it was the lady who gave me the hand warmer. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, um, anyways, I forget what the question was, how we got down that rabbit trail, but here we are. Well, we wanted I all of this is on the way to to talking about Dilly and how yeah. you got to Dilly, which is a detention center in Texas. Right. And so can you tell us a little bit about how you got there and what you did there? Yes. So I, um, so when I retired in April, 2019, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do, um, for my encore career. And I had a few months as the development director at a Franciscan, um, social services agency. Um, and that just wasn't doing it. So then I had a few months in, uh, in the, in the fall of, um, in the late summer and fall of 2019, when I was kind of flailing around, and um, it was kind of like um, a dark night of my soul, you know, hey, God, where's this encore career that, you know, I know I'm supposed to have. So I heard about um, a legal aid organization in Cincinnati, the Immigrant and Refugee Law Center, and their only clients are immigrants and refugees. It's one of the few legal aid organizations in the country where the clients are exclusively immigrants and refugees. So I got hooked up with them and they recruit local lawyers to, you know, help train them in immigration law and then get them to help them with their caseload, their pro bono cases. So I went to a, in the, in the, in the fall of last year, right about a year ago, I went to a, a, a weekend conference on learning, you know, the ins and outs of the citizenship application. And I struck up a conversation with the immigration lawyer that, who was given the conference and I gave him my elevator speech on, you know, rewired, encore career, et cetera. And he said, well, you should think about coming to, coming with us to Dilly next uh, February, next January, 
when a delegation of Ohio immigration lawyers goes down to the ICE jail in Dilly and we work for a week with the women and children there on their asylum claims. So um, that's how I got there. And so the last week of January of this year, when there were just tiny little news bites about this thing called the coronavirus, and we were all going, ah, that's just some Chinese problem, you know, it's never going to come here. So, um, so, I, so I, I went down there with 10, there was, there was actually nine of us, there were seven lawyers, um, five were experienced immigration lawyers, and myself and a lawyer from Cleveland had no experience, but we went with our hearts. And um, the other five spoke fluent Spanish, myself and the guy from Cleveland didn't, so they got us our own interpreter, so I had my own interpreter for the whole week. Um, her name was Cindy Lepley. She's the, um, she has a PhD in Spanish and she's the head of the Spanish department at Heidelberg College in Ohio. And she has a history of going down to the jails and acting as an interpreter and taking kids, college kids down there to do that. So, so, you know, we had all kinds of training and we fly into San Antonio on Sunday afternoon, have some more training. Then we drive an hour and a half to Dilly. And then the lobbyist who's used to checking in at the JW Marriott for $600 a night checks into the Days Inn in Dilly, you know, for $49. <laughs> but, um, but that didn't matter. So, um, so now it's, so our offices were in the jail. So Monday morning, um, we show up at the, uh, at the, ICE fam the, at the ICE Residential Detention Center in Dilly, Texas. It's run by Core Civic. It's one of the private run for-profit prisons. Right. And I will never forget when we pulled up. It was it was late January, but it was still hotter than heck. It's Texas. Right. It was it was it was like in the 90s the whole week. Wow. But we we pulled up and there's this large expanse of a shockingly white gravel parking lot. And the prison is a bunch of mobile homes and prefab buildings that are all linked together. Hmm. And over the entire campus are a bank of a thousand football stadium lights that are on 24 hours a day. And I just looked at it and I thought, I've never seen Auschwitz or any of the concentration camps in Germany, but this sure looks like a concentration camp to me. It was just it was macabre, the scene, okay? Then we, we, you know, we had to go through all kinds of security and pre-checks before we went. And um, it's just a little unnerving going through security because it's ice, ice guards and the, and the for hire guards. And, you know, we, we get through and we get into the area and the local, um, it was the San Antonio, I think it's called Rio Grande Legal Aid. They're the ones who were, who really got this thing going? They, they they pushed ICE to allow them to have an office inside the jail to do pro bono work. Okay, so without them, this wouldn't have happened. So there was always this tension: Will they kick us out at some point? Okay, so that's always kind of in the back of your mind. So we go through security, and we and we go through this door, and we go into this large meeting area. There's, it's like a it's like a gathering space and there's 15 rooms around the exterior for client meetings and we walk in and there are 80 women and children sitting in circles you know circles of chairs and they're all wearing these colorful um, sweatshirts and sweatpants I mean they all get the same clothing you know from the detention center and you just look around and you see moms. And, and, and I know that there was older kids, but in my mind, every kid was a three-year-old. Hmm. They're three-year-olds in their mom's lap, lap. They're crying, they're laughing, they're sniffing, they're playing at the water cooler. Um, and, and we were told, you can shake your client's hand, but you cannot hug them and you can't have any contact with the kids. And we're in there in the first half an hour and I'm, I walk around to get something and a little three-year-old hands me an origami bird that he made, but I could, but I couldn't accept it. Okay, so it's kids. Okay, and I kept thinking, moms and kids should not be in jail. 
okay? So, um, so I could talk about this for you know hours, but let's just jump into three of my three of my cases, okay? Um, in this office, there's two types of law we do. We help prepare the moms for their credible fear interview with an asylum officer. And think of this situation as a preliminary hearing for those who are seeking asylum. They first have to convince the government that they have a credible fear of persecution if they go back home. And if they, if they, meet, if, if they, if they convince the government there is a credible fear, then they get to go to their sponsor wherever in America and go through the formal asylum application process. Right. So we would, we would, there were two procedures. We would prepare them for their credible fear interview. And under the rules, they could not have a lawyer present. Okay. So we could just prepare them, but we couldn't go with them. And then the second, the second procedure that we prepared them for were um, immigration court appeals of a denial of a credible fear. Okay. On the credible fear. Real quick, did you have to learn a whole new form of law to help them? Yes, I, I had to, we had to really, we had to go, we had to do a deep dive into asylum law, okay? okay. That's not and, a small thing, I imagine. Right? No, that's not a small thing at all. And of course, we had all kinds of cheat sheets and we would, you know, study all the time. And, um, but as a lawyer, we're trained when you get a new case, you'll learn the facts, you'll learn the law and you go do it. And, you know, over and over through the five days, it starts to roll off your tongue. So, um, so that so then so the second type of um, procedure is uh, appealing a negative determination on a credible fear um, interview. If they have the interview and the asylum officer either says negative, I don't believe you, or positive, I believe you, and you get to continue on into the system. Mm -hmm. So I so and these these preps take five or six hours for, for, for an asylum interview or one of these appeals, we were with the client for four to five to six hours. Of course, I'm a white Caucasian guy, don't speak Spanish. So first, I with my interpreter, I had to establish credibility. I'm your friend. I'm here to help you. You can tell me anything and it's not going to get repeated. And then you go, then you go, then you ask them about their story. And then you kind of cross-examine them so they get it right. And then you figure out which part of the asylum law works best for them. And this takes five or six hours. So on, so on, the, uh, on the appeals of a negative termination, I prepped, I had 10 clients that week and four had that procedure. And three of the four that I prepped had their hearing while I was there, okay? So I would spend five or six hours preparing them for the hearing and then one of the experienced lawyers in our uh, posse would actually, uh, I would prep the case, give them the sheet. They would go to the hearing and do the case and then do the next one and the next one. And um, what, this is a great analogy. One of, while we were there, one of, I heard one of the lawyers uh, tell this story that um, one of his law partners called and said, hey, Tom, what's it like down there? What, what's it like what you're doing? And when he said this, I'll never forget it because it so captured what we were doing. He said, every case is like a death penalty case. The line is out the door. The hearing is tomorrow. Our clients don't speak English. And while we're trying to prepare them for their life and death hearing, we're competing for their attention with their three-year-old child who's running around the room and tugging on mommy's sleeve, okay? So the tension oh was thick as a knife. and. And we, one thing they warned us about is you need to be prepared for secondary trauma because it will, it will hit you like it's hitting me again right now. Okay. So this first, this first case I prepared for appeal, um, her and her family were targeted for assassination by a cartel in Mexico because her uncle spoke out against the cartel. So she, you know, she told me her story, you know, she made her way through Mexico and it's, there's kind of like an underground railroad that helps them hopscotch their way to the border. And they kept, she kept getting reports that the police in the previous town were looking for her. Well, what she found out the last night before she got to the border was that it was the cartel 
they were in fake police uniforms. They had fake police cars and they were trying to hunt her down and kill her, okay? So I prepare her for five or six hours. And the last question she asks me, if I lose tomorrow morning, how much time will I have before they send me back? Because the cartel will be waiting at the border to kill me and my son. And you know, that's tough, okay? So, and I'm thinking to myself, am I gonna be able to help these people at all? I'm not an immigration lawyer. I just have a good heart. So the next morning, she has her hearing. And, and let, me, let me also say this. So we work from eight to six, and then we go back, we have, a, we have a meal, then we go back to our hotel room. And you just wanna like decompress, but you can't because you have to log onto the system and put in all of your case prep notes from the day so that the person handling the case tomorrow has the case notes and you sit there and you hear the clock ticking and it's like, I wanna to go to bed. But if I don't get these notes done, someone may die and lo may lose their hearing and die. So it's very tense. So this, this woman I told you about who was targeted by the cartel, so she has her hear hearing early in the morning and uh, one of the other lawyers handled it and a lawyer from Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. And after their hearing, they're allowed to come back into our, to our jail office area. And I see her come in with, with her child and the tears are streaming down her face. And she's looking around the office area for me and my interpreter. And she finds us and she comes over and she just starts saying, positivo, positivo, meaning it was reversed and they turned her negative into a positive. And my interpreter and I just started sobbing, okay? Um, and this, this went on, this is the whole week, okay? These stories that they tell us. Another client was the sex slave of a police chief in Guatemala. Her boyfriend was ordered to turn her over. Um, and I spent five or six hours prepping her. And again, her three-year-old was in the room the whole time. And um, so she had her hearing. And I, and of course, you know, lawyers love to win cases. And I kept thinking, wow, that was pretty cool that I won that other case. So she comes back in with the tears streaming down her face and tells us that she's won her case. <laughs> I go, oh my gosh, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And then my third, um, she, she was a bisexual and she was afraid. So when she, you know, she was uh, in danger in her, in her village in Mexico. And she, when, she, when you cross the border and they apprehend you, they ask you, why are you fleeing? And, you know, she said something like violence in my hometown because she was afraid to tell them. Um, so she comes in for the for for my meeting and she's just all kind of you know quiet and you know silent and um so i you know i she says you know she says first she said she was gay and then she said no, i'm not actually gay i'm bisexual and she told us the story of how she eventually told the people in that the ice folks that that was the situation so my job with her was to get her to own who she is and not be ashamed of it and to let her know that in the United States of America, you know, you don't go to jail because you're a bisexual, okay? So, um, so that was another, you know, five or six hour hearing. And um, so her hearing was the next day. It wasn't until the afternoon. And um, sometime in the mid-afternoon, the lawyer from Cleveland that handled her case came back from the court area. There's a little mock courtroom. And he said, Scott, I don't know what you did, but I really didn't have to do or say anything. She went in there bold and proud of who she was, and she told the judge. And these judges, they, they, they video in from around the country, and you don't know until the day before who's going to be your judge. And we felt pretty good when we knew that this was going to be a, an immigration judge from Boston, okay? So the lawyer says, you know, the hearing goes on. 
and, and the judges make their ruling instantly. There's no waiting for a written opinion. Oh, wow. and, the judge, and the judge says, it's, a, it's, it's instant justice, you know? You go back or you get to stay. And, the, and, and he said that the judge said, ma'am, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Congratulations and welcome to the United States of America. I'm giving you a positive. So we hear all the stories about so many of the immigration judges um, seem to be biased, um, and many of them are, but we can't forget that there's many good immigration judges, and this, this person from Boston was one of the good ones. Um, so then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I wasn't the lawyer in the courtroom, but my work helped these three women win reversals of their negative credible fear determinations. And that week, I mean, there are so many stories I could share about it. I mean, um, I would always, you know, it's, they're from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and 99% of the time they're gonna be Catholics. Right. So I learned one phrase that I could speak in Spanish and I, I would always use it to close a prep meeting, but I would, I, would, I would try to make sure that I had an idea that maybe they were, you know, religious or Catholic or whatever. And it was, and I, I'm not a very good Spanish speaker, Dios contigo, God be with you. And so that was always my signature sign off. And every time I did that, then they opened up with incredible things. And you know, I said it to one, to one woman, and she had been clutching some little black book the whole time. And I said that to her and she said, this is my Bible. Can I take my Bible to the hearing tomorrow? It would give me such comfort if I could. And it's like, oh my gosh. So I said, yes, you can take your Bible. And then, then I, uh, I, I gave her a scripture I know that I got from my dental hygienist years ago when I showed up in the dental chair after a long drought and I was scared to death. And she said, Scott, just think of Isaiah 41, 13. I am the Lord, your God, and I'm holding your right hand. Mm -hmm. So I, so this woman who wanted to take her Bible and I said, whatever her name was, I said, and when you're getting worried or scared, just think of Isaiah 41, 13. God is holding your right hand. And when you're in there and scared, just start squeezing your right fist and pretend that it's God who's squeezing your right wrist. Mm -hmm. But and there, there were so many stories that, that Dios Contigo opened up all kinds of things. Well, it's beautiful. And, and also you're describing um, an immigration system at work, um, processing people um, to get them to their sponsors in the United States. Now, right now um, with the Remain in Mexico, uh, order, a lot of these asylum seekers are stuck in centers in Mexico and aren't able to come over to be processed to get to um, to get to their, their sponsors. And so there are groups like No More Deaths um, who are working with some people on the border, uh, raising money to try to process these cases because, you know, people are in crowded centers. They can't go back home. They can't get processed. And so uh, right now, of course, it, it's, it's a real problem. I'm wondering if you have experienced any of that or you, I'm wondering what you've experienced since COVID and since these new restrictions have been put in place on, on immigrants. What have you seen of that? Um, what can you tell us about it? Well, um, I can only tell you what I've read and heard from a lot of my colleagues in the immigration advocacy space who are giving constant updates. And early on in the pandemic, there were still a number of, um, and I'll just focus on women and children because that's what I was familiar with. There's three detention centers across America that house women and children. One's in Delhi. There's also one in another town in Texas and its name escapes me right now. And there's one in Berks, Pennsylvania. And early on in the pandemic, there were still quite a few moms and kids in these jails. And there was all kinds of things going on where th there was one point where um, the government said, it's important to get your kids out of here, but we will only do it if you sign a paper allowing them to leave without you and you stay in the prison, okay? Mm. 
uh, what kind of a Sophie's choice is that? Okay. So, and then there was, there would be little COVID outbreaks. There would be, uh, you'd hear that the guards had COVID and many lawsuits were filed to try and get people released because of the COVID threat. And um, as time went on, the populations in these detention centers dwindled. And I really can't tell you why. I, I, I think each case on its own somehow got resolved or they were able to get released. But um, like in Dilly, when I was there in Dilly, there were 1,200 um, detainees. And we were told that the prison probably could hold 1,400 to 1,600. And um, I could be wrong, so I'll say this with a grain of salt. My understanding is that there's hardly anyone left at Dilly right now, but I, but I could be wrong. Um, but unfortunately, I was not on the cutting edge of all that um, conflict that COVID created in the, in the prisons. Um, so I, I can't give you, um, I don't have any personal experience with that. Right. I, I just know from the, let me just make a pitch for the American Immigration Council. Mm -hmm. um, they do an incredible advocacy job and they also have uh, another program called the Immigration Justice Campaign. And the Immigration Justice Campaign coupled with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, they're the ones that had what was called the Dilly Pro Bono Project. That's what I was on. They're the ones that made that happen in Dilly. Okay. Um, but the American Immigration Council um, and then the American Immigration Lawyers Association, they were filing so many lawsuits left and right, my head was spinning, wow. you know, trying to look out for the rights of the detainees. Well, I guess, that brings me to the next question about the, the, the current policies, the um, obviously the negligence in the detention centers, the, the child separations, the forced hy hysterectomies, which um, we recently heard about, um, all of the prevention by deterrence policies. At what point did these become crimes against humanity? Well, um... I think they've been crimes against humanity for months or years um, since January 20th, 2017. Now, sometimes a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rookie in this space and many of the veterans will tell me about um, there, were, there were problems, you know, under the Obama administration with how they dealt with immigration. But from my own personal perspective, um, when I first pulled up at that Dilly jail, and I walked in there that that night when I walked out, I said to one of my colleagues, and this is a great story, the other interpreter that was on our team, he was a retired ICE agent. Hmm. He was in ICE law enforcement for 30 years. And he retired because he he retired shortly after the administration changed because he didn't want to be associated with you know, how it was going. And um, he and I walked out of there and he, he looked at me and he said, moms and kids should not be in jail. No way. And I said to him, it's a crime against humanity. I mean, that, that night I thought this is a crime against humanity. We don't jail moms and kids. You know, it's a very, it's a very emotional issue and it's a very politically charged issue. You know, everyone's gone into their camps, you know, the hatred camp and the, and the other camps and, you know, uh, ask 10 Americans what they think about immigrants and five will spew hatred. You know, and of course there, people will say, well, there, he just judged half of America. But I can't separate the personal impact it had on me when I saw these moms and kids, these three-year-olds, one afternoon, I was waiting for my next case, and we were we were warned, don't have any contact with the kids. This little three-year-old comes over to me and jams his sippy cup in my face. And it's like, what am I supposed to do? If I if I take it, will I be arrested? So I took it, I took the lid off, and he went over to the water cooler where the kids played all day long. You know, one of those water coolers where you pull down the, the little cones, you know, and fill it up. Yeah. He filled up his sippy cup. It was already full. And then he walked across the area, sloshing it and put it down by his mom. 
And then he comes over to me, comes back to me. And many may be familiar with the Baby Shark song. It's this irritating song that toddlers all over America watch on TV. Now I have a two and a half year old granddaughter and it's, it's known for these, the, the motion of the shark, okay? Baby shark, 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 daddy shark, shark, shark. Well, this three-year-old starts singing the Baby Shark song to me in English. And I start doing it back with him. And then my interpreter, she wants to join in. And he looks at her and says, no, two, not you. He just wanted me. Wow. And then I thought to myself, there's no dads around. Yeah. Okay. It's a little three-year-old that doesn't have his daddy. And so many of my clients told me that they're happily married. And their husband said, you need to go take our children and go so you can have a better life. Right. And this is, this is the layer that often we don't get to. People just stop. We stop. And I heard this when I lived in Southern Arizona from there's lots of conservatives there, brother and border patrol, they're breaking the law. And that's where they park their, their logic car, you know, break the law. So, you know, they're going to have to suffer the consequences regardless of what those are. And these two, these are people who are, you know, uh, Bible reading, God fearing people. And I'm always asking myself, what about the law of God, the fundamental law, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. That is the law that encompasses all other laws. It is, it is the fundamental law. So where does that get lost? And I, I mean, this is an honest question. We're talking, we've been talking with other guests about the wall that's being built. And thank God the federal government finally said it was illegal for Trump to, to divert money from the military to continue, you know, they're building at a voracious speed. They want to reach, you know, 450 miles by the by the end of the year, et cetera. And they've put a stop to that. But but the idea, the, the wall is conceptual. The wall is actually not going to be utilized to keep more people out because most drugs pass through ports of entry. Um, people who are going through the desert are the, the, the really dangerous people are building tunnels underneath it. The, the people who are crossing to, be, to, to escape persecution or to be reunited with families are going further around the wall. And those people, most a lot of those people are dying in the desert. So this wall is not about protection. The wall is a symbol of separation. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what, what, what this means. This idea of keeping America great means keeping us separate, keeping the immigrant out, keeping people of color oppressed. Um, how, how do we bridge that? And is it bridgeable for the, for the, the, for the people who, 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 again, will park their logic car at law broken, game over, absolutely not, build wall, us in here, you out there, that's the way it's gonna be. How do we address that? Or can we? I look at the Statue of Liberty. And there's, there's, all, there's all these people that say, um, there's a process, they should wait their turn and come in legally. Well, you can go on the Homeland Security website and you can see that the, the system is so regimented now that um, if you, if you want to come in um, through the bureaucratic system and follow all the rules, they, every day you go on the website and they'll have wait times based on the country you're coming from because they have quotas on how many can come from a certain country. Right. right. And for like in, for Mexico, it's a 20 year wait. Yeah. Okay. Now to all those people that, you know, we have a system, you know, you just have to follow the system. Let's go back to 1902. There was no system when the huddled masses came in, you know, ships across the ocean, you know, risking their lives. I mean, there, there was no bureaucracy built up like there is in 2020 with the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Patrol and Immigration uh, Enforcement. Um, think of all the ethnic groups, Irish, Catholic, um, I mean, uh, Italy, uh, Italians. I mean, so many groups, so many huddled masses who came to our country because that shining lady had her torch lit in New York Harbor, okay? 
what happened to the Statue of Liberty? Is the president going to close it and make it into another Trump hotel? That's almost what it feels like to me. Mm -hmm. So when people, you know, get ugly about how dare they come into our country? Well, let's go back to 1902 and remember what was, and, and of course, it wasn't the same stuff went on then. Sure. When the Italians came and the Irish and, you know, fill in, fill in the country they came from, there was terrible discrimination against them. But um, if our country loses its Statue of Liberty paradigm, there's no country left. Right. Uh, um, so, you know, like you described the wall perfectly, it's not really a wall, it's an, it's a symbol. Um, but whenever someone tries to jam the wall in my face as a symbol, I jam the Statue of Liberty right back at it. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to read it something that you wrote, um, when you were talking of your, I love this, this description of your new occupation of, of Dreamweaver, because there's something really innocent and beautiful about that. And it does go back to the, the founding of our nation and the Statue of Liberty, Liberty, helping people make their dreams of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness come true. And this includes asylum, citizenship, equal rights, social justice, no discrimination, no racism, shelter from the streets, and legal peace of mind. Now, these are this is a description of our nation's founding idea of itself. So how is it that now one needs to be a dream weaver to reintroduce our own founding principles back into society? What happened? What happened? Um, well, we're probably teetering on uh, political conversation, but um, people take cues from their leader, okay? And um, unfortunately, uh, the president made it okay to be hateful again, made it okay to be a racist, made it okay to be a white supremacist. And you know, this, um, you just don't flip a switch and racism is gone. I mean, it's, it's like, um, it's like a disease that is never fully eradicated. And every now and then under the right circumstances, you have another outbreak. Um, but, you know, the whole civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, um, I, I always ask myself, I just have no idea what it would be like if just by the color of my skin, people assumed I was a bad person, okay? Um, so many, um, you know, in my lifetime, I can't think of any president, you know, uh, my lifetime as a voter, it was um, Reagan and the Bushes, Carter, um, Obama. Um, I look back and I don't, I don't remember any of them um, encouraging hatred or encouraging racism, okay? Yeah. And um, when the guy at the top is not saying that's a bad thing, it makes people think they're okay. It makes people think they're immune from the law in the legal system if they do something that they think their president says is okay. Um, you know, look at, um, you know, Many people think George W. Bush was, you know, not a very good president. Um, I always liked his heart, okay? And when he refuses to endorse Trump, and some are saying maybe before the election he's going to come out and actually endorse Biden, but um, George W. Bush and his dad and Reagan and Obama and Carter had what I call the cardigan sweater effect. <laughs> you knew you were going to be okay when they were in the White House. Okay. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pause and pull a picture off the wall. Yeah. <clears throat> this 
these are my heroes. Wow. They all got together at the White House when, when, when George Sr. was ailing. Okay, and just look at them. Wow. These are American heroes who never put racism and nationalism and hatred um, in the national dialogue. Um, right. So those are my five guys. <laughs> those are your five guys. No, it's beautiful. And that's a, just a very succinct way of sort of identifying um, really what's what's at stake. Right. And um, I guess I guess I know we're at an hour or two. I want to be respectful of your time. I just have a couple more questions and I, I yeah. want to know about the book. But I, I guess I, I want to know in your heart, I haven't asked you this before ever, are you hopeful? How, how are you feeling about what what's up what's coming up and are you hopeful not just about the country but about humanity um if i lose hope what do i have left to live for so i have to have hope and i know that there's people out there who think of everyone as a fellow human being okay and um so my, so the dark side of my hope is this election. Mm -hmm. If he's reelected, I really don't know what's going to happen. Okay, there's we we need a cardigan sweater back in the White House, you know. Yeah. And you look, you know, politics was my career, so I'm quite a, you know, observer of politics. I have never seen early voting lines like we're seeing all over the country, okay? Early on in this campaign, you know, when it still wasn't clear who was going to be the candidate for the Democrats, there were, you know, there were many young people who said, well, there's no way I'm voting for that Biden guy. It's got to be Bernie or, you know, whoever. Um, and when I see these lines, you're waiting hours for early voting two weeks before, yeah. I think there's gonna be a landslide that the country has never seen. People are voting for humanity. For People sure. are going to the polls to vote for humanity. That's a beautiful way to put it. I know, I, I try, I'm, <laughs> I'm, tr I'm keeping my hope in check, of course, because so many people, uh, I just learned, you know, not to, to count the eggs before they're hatched, but 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 I too have felt that that sense of the early the early the lines the early voting means that they're in line for Biden, you know, not they're in line for Trump. They're right. all of the white supremacists are coming out in mass, the nationalists. That it's it's right. actually people who want to turn the tide. That's what I believe as well. Um, and you so know, tell there's us so about many there's so many people who I think the people who are voting for humanity. They don't show up in polls. They don't show up at rallies and protests. They're just good old fashioned Americans who are going to do the right thing. Okay. And, you know, as you're standing in line to vote, think of the kids in the cages. Yeah. The kids in the cages. What if tomorrow your kid was in a cage and mommy was taken away? And they sent him off to somewhere in New York with no trace and, they, and he can't be found. One child is too many. Yeah, I agree. It did the thousands though. Yeah. I'll say it. Tell us. I'll say it. What's that? This president is guilty of so many crimes against humanity. There's no, there's, there's no other, there's nothing else that describes it. Yeah. Agreed and he, amen. I don't know how he lives with himself. So, sorry, America, but I had to say it. Thank you. No, thank you. It has to be spoken. On a positive note, then let's talk um, before we close about the book that you're writing. I'm really excited about this. So I've been, you know, this all started in May of 2013, and I love to write. Um, I journal every day. One of my fun little things to do is I love to write haiku, you know, the Japanese poems of three lines, five, seven, and five. And 
I have a lot of friends who are Trappist monks and one Trappist monk who's a poet said, well, the real fun, Scott, is when you write a series of them to tell a story. Um, so I love to write and express myself. So I've been, I'm working on a book called um, Rewired by Outcasts, My Journey from Corporate Lobbyist to Social Justice Activist. And um, I've been working on it for several years. If you find me on Facebook, I have a page called Rewired by Outcasts where I occasionally post excerpts from chapters. Um, okay. And, and remind me, I just want to rattle off some organizations uh, with that you need to put up their web addresses for, for on the immigration yep. space. But um, so how do you write a book? Okay, but and it took me a while to figure it out. And I finally came up with, it's going to be a memoir of essays. It's hard to write this story in chronological fashion, but there are little vignettes I can take from all these waypoints on my journey um, where I can make points. Um, uh, so it's going to be a memoir of essays. Um, and um, if there's any publishers listening, drop me a line. <laughs> in my... Well Go ahead. I was going to ask you to read. You said that you brought, you had one on the ready. Would you read one of the the, the haikus to us? Sure. <laughs> All right. Hold on, America. Um, <laughs> so uh, this one is called Welcome Home Mystic Misfit. And um, my religion, my spirituality, I have a very intense personal relationship with God, and it often pops out in these haiku poems, but I think this one also shows a little bit about where I got the courage to do what I'm doing, and before I read it, I'll encourage everyone, if you watch this sometime tonight or tomorrow, listen to the song Brave by Sarah Borelli's, and that's kind of like a summary of what's happened to me. Um, so here's Welcome Home, Mystic Misfit. Soft clouds meander as oncoming night summons insects, tucks in birds. Backyard paradise comes alive and wraps me in late summer comfort. Human worries fade, mystical pathways to God escape from trapped thoughts. Refreshed by the night, Darkness illuminates vast possibilities. Mind stretches without fear of judgment by others and calls forth courage. I slip away from the shackles of gravity, floating in dream space. Gone are the limits imposed on me by countless doubts of who I am. I emerge from the dense fog which has hidden my journey from my soul. My true self welcomes me home well, my true self welcomes home my mystic misfit as heaven and earth smile. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. So you will include in your book with your stories and essays also the, the haikus. Yes, there'll be a number of haikus and um, there may even have to be an appendix with haikus. Um, there's one my friend Perry in Washington, who I have, you know, four years of adventures with, um, um, I, I wrote an extensive one about him. Um, but anyways, um, yes, there'll be many. And if I can put in some plugs for some websites. Um, will, you, will you email me? Yes. And I'll, then we'll put them in the underneath right. um, the interview so that they'll live there. So the, in Cincinnati, the Immigrant and Refugee Law Center, it's a 501c3, and they'll take all your money. Um, the American Immigration Council, okay. you can find them on the web. They're an incredible advocacy uh, organization for immigrants and refugees. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I did have another question, which is why is Cincinnati a hub for immigration? I'm not sure, but I think um, this, is, this is a wild guess on my part. But I think the fact that we have some large international corporations that have been that are headquartered here, like P and G is headquartered here. And I think over the years, there's been a tremendous influx of business immigration. Um, 
and quite possibly, um, you know, people related to business immigrants maybe thought, well, you know, my family's doing well in Cincinnati, let's go there. This is a pure, you know, guess on my part, but um, however it started, we have, a, we have a robust immigrant advocacy community in Cincinnati. The Archdiocese of Cincinnati has, a, has an organization called the Immigration Task Force, which brings together all of the immigrant advocate organizations and they meet monthly to, you know, plan events and strategy. Um, and then we have a group called the, in fact, I'm going to give you uh, their web address and then also an incredible organization called the Immigrant Dignity Coalition. Um, that that is that is organized to make sure that immigrants never feel like they've lost their dignity, so that they can be respected and dignified. And they're a tremendous um, advocacy source for um, immigrants and refugees in Cincinnati. Okay, wonderful. Well, yeah, we'll be sure to put those all in the in the footer of this. So um, thank you so much. This has been so enjoyable to chat with you and see your face. <laughs> um, and I, I really appreciate everything you shared. Um, it's an You're welcome. It's been, uh, it's been a, as they used to say when they introduced the president to give the um, State of the Union address, it's been a high personal honor and privilege for me to be on your Facebook Live series. And I look forward to meeting you um, in Cincinnati with yep. masks on yep. <laughs> at some point during this weekend. So, and thanks again for that, um, that referral to uh, the Esquire. We're super excited to come. So, all right. All, all right. right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Scott. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Take all care. Bye-bye. Right.